The film begins with a young girl, my son, inquiring of her grandmother about her father's whereabouts because it is her birthday. My son shakes her grandmother's body to wake her up when she doesn't respond, but it turns out she died of a heart attack. In contrast, two siblings, a girl and a boy, are trapped in a wrecked train following a crash. The boy takes his sister's mother's body and holds her close to protect her from falling debris. My son has grown up and is now working as a stewardess on her first night shift. My son meets her male co-worker, Chan, who is perplexed to see her. My son explains that she has swapped shifts with a co-worker to work that day because it is the last run of the train. As the passengers disembark from the train, the conductor drives away from the station. As the conductor announces that the journey to Seoul will take 6 hours and 35 minutes, my son sells food and beverages to the passengers with her cart. During a brief pause for food, Chan informs my son of the conductor's retirement party. My son notices the coincidence because it is her birthday, which surprises Chan because she has switched shifts. My son simply responds that she has her reasons, but Chan is unconvinced. He brings up the train crash from years ago. The train coaches from the crash that killed 250 people have been incorporated into the train they are riding on. My son repeats her rounds because she doesn't find Chan scaring her a funny act. Soon after, Chan, my son, and another co-worker surprise the conductor by informing him of his retirement. While eating the cake, one of the conductors pulls the stop lever unexpectedly after seeing a little girl in a red dress on the rails, causing the passengers to collide. After inspecting the rails, the conductor returns to the train and informs his co-worker that he might be seeing things due to the unusual weather. The journey to Seoul continues, with a group of teenagers filming a man in a suit who claims to have seen something strange and creepy on the same train three years ago. As the man points to a seat where he claims to have seen a ghost, one of the teenagers with her third eye open confirms the presence of something. My son doesn't pay attention to what they're doing because they're teenagers, and advises them to avoid moving around too much because they might hurt themselves. My son takes a break and sits next to a little girl who is all alone. My son gives the child a snack after she tells her that she will meet her mother at the last stop. My son looks through the girl's sketchbook and finds a drawing of herself pushing a food cart on a train. My son is informed by the girl that the woman is her mother. My son realizes as she looks at the drawn passengers that these are some of the victims of the train crash she saw on the news years ago. This frightens her because she can't believe a little girl can draw something that happened before she was born. The girl grabs the sketchbook and scribbles over the drawing with a red colored pencil. My son tries to stop her, but the girl colors her hand as well. So my son is in the bathroom, washing her hand, when her co-worker walks in and fixes her uniform. She walks away without saying anything and without paying attention to my son. As my son looks away, her cart starts moving by itself, as if it's being pushed by something unseen. My son notices the cart approaching her and quickly opens the coach door, allowing her to enter just in time. When she turns around, she sees the passengers in the drawing, who are motionless. As she backs away in terror, something black falls on her face, causing her to scream in terror. My scream son startles the passengers in that coach, and it turns out it's just a black wig owned by one of them. My son walks away, returning to the passageway to clean up her food cart as if nothing had happened. When a co-worker asks her to stop by the snack bar, the psychic girl who can see ghosts from earlier assists my son on her food cart. My son runs into her a few moments later, and the co-worker arrests her for causing such a commotion among the passengers and leaving the cart unattended. My son apologizes to the passengers, and one of their co-workers says it's normal for her to be nervous on her first day. My son relaxes in the nap room. Meanwhile, a newlywed couple comes across the guy's former professor. Another passenger, a man in his late fifties who sits across from the professor, listens as he catches up with his former student. The wig owner, on the other hand, examines herself in the bathroom mirror while wearing the wig. Something unseen wraps the wig around her face and neck, completely covering her head. The woman's eyes are filled with horror as she is unable to speak. Soon after, the woman's friend goes on the hunt for her, asking passengers if they have seen the wig owner. The friend makes another attempt to contact the woman, but it is futile. The train soon comes to a stop at the first stop, and a man gets off after breaking up with his girlfriend. My son notices the little girl walking alone in the fog with her sketchbook as another group of passengers board the train. My son pursues her, but she is lost in the thick fog. On the train, however, she spots a man who resembles her father. My co-worker's sons summon her attention as the train departs, and when she turns around, the man has vanished. My son boards the train, still perplexed, and as it departs, a passenger at the station notices some dead passengers from the train crash inside. 
Chan notices my son staring into space and asks if she's okay. My son responds that she continues to see things. Chan responds skeptically, claiming that working the night shift exhausts her and causes her to fantasize. My son shifts the conversation and explains why she chose her birthday to work on that train. Her father, it turns out, was the conductor of the train that crashed years ago. Chan also admits that he knew her father. My son expresses her feelings about how, following the accident, she was perceived as the daughter of the train conductor who killed 250 people. That's why she boarded the train, hoping to start over and put an end to her tragedy. Chan consoles her by telling her that her father is proud of her. Meanwhile, in one of the stalls, the woman who had her heart broken by her boyfriend smokes a cigarette. The lights go out shortly after, so the woman uses her lighter to see in the dark. But then she notices something frightening. Meanwhile, the professor is talking with the man across from him. The man displays a photograph of his young daughter as well as the music box he purchased for her. The professor then shows a photo of his wife, and they both laugh as they compliment each other's loved ones. Chan, on the other hand, describes how my father's sons assisted him during his first shift. Chan and my son smell cigarette smoke as they walk past the restroom. So they investigate and discover not only the cigarette, but also the heartbroken woman's corpse by the toilet. Her eyes and mouth are agape open as she lies on the cold floor. Chan immediately contacts the police and reports what has occurred. The cops will board the train at the next stop, and no passengers will be allowed to leave until the killer is apprehended. My son sits by the corpse at this time to protect the woman's body from passing passengers. My son is looking through the woman's phone, unaware that the corpse is approaching her slowly. Someone suddenly takes flash photography of her. The photographer is a friend of the psychic girl. My son warns the psychic girl and her friend not to interfere. The psychic girl does not respond and walks away with the photographer, as if she has just witnessed something terrifying. My son sees herself in a room with the dead passengers from the train crash years ago as she returns to the coaches. She immediately switches to another coach, only to be disturbed by her co-worker's strange behavior toward her. The co-worker tells her with a straight face that she will die, just like every other passenger on that train, instilling fear in her chest. Everything returns to normalcy, and the co-worker is perplexed by my reaction. Sons my son screams at her, then sobs that they're all going to die, frightening the passengers. A co-worker tells her to calm down, but my son notices something. A train stewardess is walking down the aisle when she unintentionally kicks a bottle of medicine. The glass shatters, and blue powder falls to the floor, prompting a man to pursue her. The flashback concludes, and Chan asks my son, who has passed out, if she is okay. She inquires of Chan about Jean, the train stewardess in her vision, and her name comes to mind. Chan reveals that he was present on the night of the train crash and witnessed Jin's death. He's perplexed as to why my son is the only one who can see the past, so my son takes things into her own hands. Meanwhile, the professor panics after returning from the restroom because his dissertation has vanished. He searches for it and discovers it, mysteriously on fire, in one of the bathrooms. The passengers assist him in putting out the fire, but his dissertation has already burned. My son, on the other hand, tells the psychic girl everything, who informs them that after their last stop, she felt a spiritual presence on the train. My son and Chan seek her assistance, but the psychic girl is hesitant because seeing the spirit of the dead still frightens her. They then proceed to the bathroom, where they discovered the heartbroken woman's corpse, only to discover that she has vanished. My son returns the psychic girl to her seat after she becomes uneasy and returns to the passageway to get some medicine. At this point, he, a woman, is smoking by the passageway with her brother, reminiscing about how they survived the train crash. They are siblings who wish they had died with their mother because they believe death is their final destination. Despite their blood relationship, the siblings perform a deep-to-throat tongue massage. On the other side, the psychic girl discovers a book near her seat and is taken aback when she recognizes the family on one of the pages. At the same time, the photographer wanders around an empty coach, envious that he cannot see the spirits of the dead. Jin's horrifying face appears before him as he wanders his eyes with his Polaroid camera. As a result of the shock, the photographer drops his camera and hits his head on the seat. Meanwhile, when my son returns, the psychic girl has left her seat. Before going looking for her, my son reads the book the psychic girl found and comes across several newspaper clippings about the train crash. But it's the one with the departure time that catches her eye as she realizes something. She shows it to Chan and explains that when they stopped, they stalled for 10 minutes. The exact time as the last departure time of the crash train. She believes the ghost train collided with theirs, but Chan abruptly changes the subject. 
He admits that he and Jean were seeing each other exclusively, and that they had a stupid argument the night of the accident. That was the last time he saw her before Jean was kidnapped, and Sean has never wanted to think about the past since. My son insists on stopping the train because the psychic girl has vanished. However, Chan disagrees because they're almost to the next stop, where the cops are waiting. As my son begins her search for the psychic girl, she discovers her lying beneath the seats, bathing in her own blood. My son notices the psychic girl holding something and investigates. It's his bracelet, which means he is the one who harmed the psychic girl. The psychic girl encourages my son to send back the spirits of the deceased passengers with her remaining strength. He enters seconds later, followed by her brother. My son tries to flee when he stabs her in the shoulder with a pair of scissors and then kicks her to the ground. Soon after, the crew discovers that the train isn't slowing down because he and her brother have killed the engine man in order to seize control of the train. The passengers are also terrified because the train has not stopped at the station where the police are waiting. The passengers are immediately evacuated to the rear as the crew realizes the train is about to collide with another train. My son awakens to find her father, the man sitting across from the professor in front of her. The father bids my son farewell and tells her that he will take the passenger's lost souls with him as he departs. Following that, the father vanishes. Simultaneously, a group of passengers discovers the photographer's body on the floor. They flee in terror as the Polaroids begin to fly due to a strong wind. As they join the other passengers, the lights begin to break, prompting them to move forward. The ghost train appears as the lights flicker, altering the train's appearance. My son and Sean realize they must drive the train to the accident site to prevent it from haunting them again, despite the fact that it was sealed off for years after the crash. As they approach the control room, a hand grabs my foot, Sons and Jean emerges from the pool of blood. Jean starts crawling towards my son, who appears to be paralyzed from shock. When Sean apologizes for not being able to save my son, Jean almost possesses her. Jean steps back, because that's all she wants to hear because she died on bad terms with Sean. Every passenger is terrified for their lives at this point, as they see themselves inside the train that crashed years ago. Meanwhile, my son gains access to the control room and stabs he in the arm with the scissors. She threatens to kill he if the train is not stopped. He's brother, on the other hand, is much stronger, and the siblings soon take her hostage. They show my son he's burnt arm from the crash, but my son tells them to look again because there is no scar. The siblings do as they are told, and there is no scar. My son explains that they did not survive the crash and are simply lost souls inhabiting the bodies of others. A flashback reveals that he and her brother were among the children killed in the crash years ago. Jean repeatedly smashes my head sons into the door glass in rage, staining it with her blood. My dead son's father enters the control room moments later and pilots the train harmlessly through the ghost train, merging the two trains, the supernatural and the real. As the merging comes to an end, his brother returns to his child self comforting his younger sister. My father's sons holds her hand and apologizes for taking so long to return home to her. At this point, several passengers who turn out to be dead vanish, and the coaches return to their normal state. Life has already left my son, who is now with her father, as the sun rises. The train has come to a halt, and the befuddled passengers disembark. The scene shifts back to night, and the train arrives at Seoul Station for its final journey. The film concludes with a couple boarding the train, and my son standing on the platform as the camera reveals that it is the ghost train, implying that the terror of it will never end and will haunt the passengers.